Good morning, good day, good evening, good overnight, or whenever you happen to be listening to this. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. Current events for late March of 2022. We're going to be discussing quite a few things here that are going on in the world. First and foremost, I'm going to start off with a few days ago, our illustrious president, Sleepy Joe, said, quote, There is going to be a new world order, and we, meaning, of course, the Kenites, excuse me, excuse me, I mean the United States, yeah, 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 that, that's what I meant, must take the lead. Given the current mess that the United States is in, with high inflation, with the rising cost of living, and the policies of this current administration, uh, really the policies of the elite behind the scenes, because I doubt very seriously this president has got any clue what's even going on. Probably they have him sitting coloring in coloring books when he's on his off time. But we can see with how bad things are that in the foreseeable future we could see a big red wave forming not only in this year of 2022 in the upcoming elections but also again in 2024 with either Trump put back at the helm or some other big name conservative likened to a Trump style politician who will be seen as a contrast alternative to Sleepy Joe or anyone that they might run from the hard left. Now, the current narrative illness, which is now oddly enough fading into the rearview mirror, began this current phase that we're in that is to say, the, the current, current phase. It's been going on for a long time, believe me, but the latest thing, the latest trend. And now we also have a war between Russia and Ukraine. And it's easy to take a look around the world at the attitudes, and around our country, quite frankly, and see that Americans are witnessing Sleepy Joe's weakness with regards to this war and will no doubt want to replace him with a hero or a man of action to lead them. Now, are Sleepy Joe's policies really his own? Doubtful. But whatever happens, don't be fooled. I have said that Russia, and specifically Putin, was not the bad guy in this war. However, that does not mean that Putin is an angel or is a good guy. And this by no means means that this war, the United States, the United Nations, and or NATO, or Russia, are acting on their own. Meaning, they're not acting independently as a nation's ruler as we have formerly thought of a nation's ruler. No, far from it. In my mind, and this is supposition on my part, but a pretty fair supposition, they're all team players. Because we've seen what happens to those who do not play ball with the powers that be. I mean, uh, if Putin and Biden and whoever else of the other nations was not playing ball before long you would see them disappear they would either be dead of uh, something 
or have a heart attack or fall down some stairs or they would be besmirched and disgraced and become powerless. Another thing we've seen is that the teeth or the power of the UN has been filed down as policy after policy and sanction after sanction agreed upon by the UN body have been nothing less than impotent and weak. And many have felt for some time perhaps, even uh, gleefully, that the UN is about to collapse upon itself and about to fall. And this would not surprise me in the least if it does happen. But with regards to any future U.S. president, or Putin, or Xi Jinping, or any other world leader of consequence, I'm a firm believer that what we are witnessing, whether with a war, or with sanctions, or revenue, or taxation, are nothing more than one big illusion being put on and controlled from the very top down. And when I say from the very top, obviously, I mean the centralized banking system, the Federal Reserve, and uh, I might as well just say it, the four hidden dynasties. The Kenites are working hard to perfect their plans to build world government. And as far as the world playing field, there is no real us versus them. There is no we who are the good guys and they who are the bad guys with regards to the political system or the economical system or the religious system or the educational arena. Because they're all working in concert together, save of those, you know, of us who know the truth and can pretty much understand what we're witnessing in the big illusion being played out on the the grand field here. In short, what we're seeing here has been carefully thought out from the border disputes. In other words, here in America we have an open border policy to the inability of us to get our own oil, coal, and gas reserves because of environmental concerns to the war in Russia and Ukraine and things all across the board such as the higher prices we are seeing because of the war at least supposedly because of the war also if you've been keeping up with what's going on in the stock market and with the national debt and the Federal Reserve they're saying that no doubt that they will have to raise interest rates across the board over the next few quarters and possibly the next few years to uh, adjust their balance sheet. In other words, to make everything balance out for them. Not for the world, not for the countries, but for them. So, what we are witnessing is calculated. It's not just Putin standing up for Russia's borders and being some kind of hero and Biden sending tons of money to the Ukraine and uh, inviting millions over here to our country. It's not just gas prices going up or shortages which we can see or rent and the cost of living going up beyond uh, fathomable means. What we're seeing here is life being made more difficult for the working class, for the poor, and sadly at times even for those who are rich. Many things going on in the world right now that are illusions. Big orchestrated illusions, uh, excuse me, orchestrated illusions. Carefully planned out moves. I do believe that Putin is controlled. Biden is controlled. The circumstances around the world are controlled. And the mainstream media and social media 
are on a m mission to put out as much misinformation and disinformation as possible to make it seem like this war and inflation and all the fallout from it is a natural cause and effect of, of countries just de disagreeing with each other over borders or over policies when in reality it's more like we're watching uh, a, a, a bad uh, television production of wrestling where we see the hero and the heel the bad guy versus the good guy that is to say until the show's over and they all go backstage and commend themselves on their great performance and sit down and have a beer together in other words what I'm saying here in plain language is what we have been witness to and what has been going on for quite a long time now is a bunch of smoke and mirrors everything is being set up everything is being orchestrated things are happening to keep your eyes off what's really going on <clears throat> it's all part of the show I mean just like this fiasco that we have going on right now with the uh, new Supreme Court Justice candidate that uh, they're fixing to put on the Supreme Court bench that too is part of the show now, I don't even know why the media says that the uh, conservatives are grilling this uh, young woman when clearly they haven't even let the coals for the fire yet in other words they're not grilling her they're trying to make it look like they're grilling her she will sit on the Supreme Court no matter what her record shows no matter how lenient she has been towards crime no matter what leftist views she holds and this will happen because of two things she is a woman first of all and she's a minority you know I was watching our local news just last night as a matter of fact and they said on our local news that polls show in other words when they did a cross-section of Americans polls show that the majority of people feel that the Supreme Court should more accurately display the diversity of our country now what is this a translation for this means this young woman no matter how much of a leftist she is or no matter how lenient she's been on crime is going to get a free pass because she is a woman and because of her race these polls are conducted by means of asking a simple question which has an answer of yes or no and the question asked will no doubt be something like should America have a Supreme Court which is more accurately uh, representative of America's diversity and of course people are going to say yes to that and the media is going to imply that more people are for this socialist female minority to get on the Supreme Court just because she's a socialist female minority. The question that was not asked by the people that call and do these Gallup polls or, or whatever you want was do you agree with Biden's choice for this candidate given her left-leaning views and her leniency on crime in the past? I can pretty much guarantee that if that question had been asked you'd have gotten a different answer altogether but you can tell a lot about a person by their past and by who nominates them and who supports them and if you look at the track record of this woman you'll see that she has been having felons released or given much lesser sentences than is called for by the law. The data on this judge, uh, Ketanji Brown, suggests that she is being painted as a moderate, but in, in fact she will lean far left on most if not all of the issues and on her decisions. And this is how you get a leftist and a socialist onto the Supreme Court. 
you make sure that you choose a woman, you make sure that you choose a minority, and you make sure that she's got the support of the Democratic media and social media. Because I promise you, if you go and try to look up this woman's track record on Google or many other sites, what you're going to see is nothing but positive praise of her until you get to about the 10th or 12th page. Then you'll see some facts coming out. The only thing that would make her even more qualified to the left is if she was transgender or a lesbian. She will no doubt be confirmed. But again, this too is all part of the big show. All part of the distraction to keep your eyes off what's actually going on. And the show is should be called How the People of the World Are Being Manipulated. How we're going to enter into global one world government. Because with this war going on, with such terrible times upon us, gas prices up, food prices up, rent up, and people still struggling to recover from the current narrative illness. People are more concerned whatever with world peace and a better economy. And people are overly concerned with things like clean energy because of, dare I say it, climate change! It's all a ruse. It's been carefully planned as to who will act what part and when. The decisions, of course, being made by the very top, the elite, better said the sons of Cain's, who are the true power behind the power. I have said many times that the Kenites always have a plan. They always play both sides of the field. In this way, they can never lose. It's like having so much power and wealth till you can do anything you want. The wealth doesn't really matter to you. Power is now what they seek. I mean, let, let's give this a metaphor to help better understand it. Let's say the world Kenites all went to a horse race. The Kenites are going to bet on every horse. Why? Because they have the money to do so. That way they're not going to lose. And the losses that they might incur and the little amount of money that they're going to lose in the horses that don't win are not even going to bother them since power is their goal. And their vision is world government. And it's being done by dark underhanded moves. I mean, they are really playing out the game on the uh, grand chessboard here. So, I alluded to earlier, is it their plan for the UN to fail? Even though the UN was instrumental in uh, bringing the nations together as it has to have as many uh, part of the pre-world government as it is right now in the United Nations? Of course. Does that mean it will fail? No. The Kenites can switch up tactics. But they do not care about anybody or any people or any nation in and of itself. They are only concerned with building world government. That is to say, they are building the world government that we read about in our Father's Word. And they will build some portion of it to fail. Whether they cause a war, whether it's a, an economic disaster, whatever happens. The system is going to fail. The world government is going to fail right at it, right it, its uh, pinnacle of gaining power. And then their father Satan can do, come down here claiming to be Jesus Christ returned and heal the deadly wound of the uh, political system. That is to say the first beast of the book of Revelation chapter 13. And this will make the world system solidify and become the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 as God forewarned us of. Again, the Kenites always have a plan. They always have alternatives for every contingency. 
They will play left wing and they will play right wing. Why? Because they control them all. I'm not saying there's not one or two good ones. But the Kenites have even left that door open so that there can be a few good ones out there. Why? People have to trust in some of their representatives. But they will play Russia or China or the Arab nations or America or Israel because they are in control of all of them. The Kenites at their whims can do whatever they want. They can inflate the stock market to make things seem good and secure or they can crash it on a moment's notice. They can bring lower prices and a better economy or they can bring inflation and desperation as it suits them. And all of it to achieve their goal. And they shall achieve their goal of world government no matter what anyone says to the contrary. If we look at the G7 summit that uh, went on recently, They've been telling us their plans to enact a new digital currency. The uh, Central Bank Digital Currency, CBDC, which will not only be a currency that's much easier to use than money, it can be tracked a lot easier, but it's programmable. Meaning the government can decide what you are allowed to spend and what you're not allowed to spend. They can tell you what you're allowed to purchase, from foods to goods and what you're not allowed to purchase. They can control your diet and eating habits. They can tell you what you are or are not allowed to own. They can control your buying and selling. Again, I've always maintained that that can be a literal written of in the book of Revelation. But I can tell you this, World government is coming and will not be stopped. <clears throat> I know that people have gotten behind this whole Q movement and uh, think that Trump and Putin and Xi Ping or whatever his name is in China are all working together behind the scenes to stop uh, the centralized banks and to stop the world government from happening. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Why do we know this? Because world government is on the lips of most all the people of power in the governments around the world. But more importantly than this, God has already shown us in his word and told us that it shall come to pass. There is no question of it coming to pass. There is no fighting it off or staving it off. It will come to pass at the appointed time, as God has told us. And all the events that follow its coming shall fall into place exactly as they are. From the deadly wound to the coming of the Antichrist, which is to say Satan claiming to be Christ, for five months. And then, of course, the return of the true Christ after the death of the two witnesses in the streets of Jerusalem, about three and a half days later. But yes, we're going to see this come to pass. You know, there's virtually not very many things in the Bible that I haven't covered. I know some of you probably get sick of hearing the same verses read over and over and over again. And um, I think about that from time to time when I'm, I'm doing these studies as to what chapters I'm going to use. Because I do teach them quite a lot, but I also know that repetitiveness helps people to remember and understand better. That being said, we're going to begin today's Bible study portion of this with Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, we're going to see how the Kenites play both sides of the field here. We're going to see how they look wholly religious and respectful, but really they're a bunch of murdering, cunning, conniving, uh, manipulating uh, people. So... Before we begin this Bible study, let us go to our Father in prayer. So, brothers and sisters, let us pray and let us pray together. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy most holy and glorious name, Father. We come before you once again, Father, gathered together to ask for your counsel. We ask for guidance and wisdom in understanding these verses, Father. We ask you to shine the life of truth upon us. We ask you, Father, to open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths. And we ask these things of you, Father, because you have promised them to us if we ask. So we do ask them in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach Christos. Amen and Amen. So now prayer having been asked, let us begin with Matthew chapter 22 and verse 1. Be turning there in your Bibles, please. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 1. And Jesus answered, and spake unto them again by parables, and said, verse 2, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. You'll be able to see the type of that. God being the king, and a marriage for his son. Verse 3. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. In other words, the people that were supposed to be there for the wedding of Christ would not come. Verse 4. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. And all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. In other words, this is God pleading for you to come to Christ. Come to Christ. Come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Don't fall to the wrong Christ. Verse 5. But they made light of it. In other words, they mocked and scoffed. And went their ways, one to his farm, and another to his merchandise. Hey, the world's more important to them. Their daily lives and their joys. Verse 6. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Now, in most cases of the Bible where you see remnant, that's a positive thing. There is a remnant that God reserved unto himself. However, like it is with most things in the Bible, there is also a negative remnant. Who do you suppose the negative remnant is? Who did Christ say was responsible for all the righteous blood shed upon the earth? You know, the people that bid to the marriage here are the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament, Christ's witnesses. So let's read that verse again. Oddly enough, it is verse 6. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. In other words, they killed them. All one has to do is look back at history at what happened to many of the prophets and the apostles. Verse 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. What city do you suppose is going to happen in the future that's going to be burned up at the return of Christ? If you were, if you were to say Jerusalem, you'd be partially correct. But moreover, the answer I'm looking for here is Babylon. Babylon of the end times. And it's a city is a metaphor, okay? We're not necessarily looking for a, a, a city up here. We're looking for a world government, Babylon. Verse 8. Then he saith to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. In other words, they failed. Verse 9. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. In other words, go invite strangers. Go find anyone who will to come to my son's wedding. You should see the Gentile being inclusive here into the salvation of our Lord and Savior. Verse 10. 
So those servants went out into all the highways and gathered as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Now bad and good here, uh, not necessarily what you would think. It just means anyone was invited to the wedding. Why? Because whether you're a bad person or a good person, if you believe upon Christ, if you repent, you're going to be allowed at the wedding. That is to say, if you aren't deceived by the Antichrist. Verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a, uh, had not on a wedding garment. In other words, he wasn't ready for the, for the wedding. Verse 12. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Verse 13. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. In other words, it's not going to be a pleasant thing when the true Christ returns. And those that thought that they were there for the wedding, but fell and worshipped the Antichrist, are not allowed to come to the wedding. Remember we covered the parable of the ten virgins in the last Bible study? Verse 14, for many are called, in other words, many are beckoned, but few are chosen. What does it mean to be chosen? It means to be predestined. Predestined how? For, from the world that was. That means you're one of God's election. But in this earth age, many are called to the wedding. They're invited to the wedding. Christ was hung on a cross and his blood was shed for them that they could come to that wedding but they're more interested in their own pursuits verse 15 then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk in other words you know the Pharisees here that's your uh, religious community real religious men a man speaking to them the Son of God, in fact, Christ. And they're looking how they might take counsel and entrap him in his own words. Verse 16. And they sent unto him, unto him their disciples with the Herodians. In other words, they sent their underling uh, priests with the Herodians, and the Herodians are naturally the, uh, the government lawyers. under Herod. Herod being the law at this time, the king, the tetriarch. Now what do these uh, disciples and Herodians say to Christ when they come up to him? Saying, Master, in other words, teacher, in other words, respected teacher even, we know that thou art true. In other words, you, you, you are a pure-hearted man and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. In other words, we know you are such a good man. We know that you teach the way of God in truth. And we know that you are not a respecter of persons or of any man. See, be careful when people approach you with flatteries. Verse 17. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? In other words, what they're asking him here is, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They're hoping he's going to say no. They're hoping he's going to rebel. Verse 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Hypocrite is a word that means play actor. It means you're putting on a show. You're not even real. You're not authentic. You're not genuine. Verse 19. Show me the tribute money. And they brought him, uh, or unto him a penny. Verse 20. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? Verse 21. And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then he saith unto him, Render therefore unto Caesar the thing which are Caesar's, 
and unto God the things which are God's. In other words, what did Christ just tell them? The law of the land is that you have to pay taxes. So pay taxes. It doesn't matter if the taxes are unfair. Nobody likes to pay taxes. Nobody likes to pay tribute. But since it is the law of the land and you don't want to go to jail, render therefore unto the government, Caesar, the things which are the government's, Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Okay, what is God's? Well, your love, your loyalty, your soul, your heart, your mind, your strength. Verse 22. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. In other words, they, they didn't have anything to say about that. It was like, whoa, we thought we had him, but uh, apparently we don't have him. Verse 23. The same day came to him Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. In other words, you got your uh, atheist aspect here. Now, do the Sadducees believe in an earthly God? Well, yeah, they kind of do. But you could say that uh, an atheist has a religion because it is, quite frankly, a religion. But these do not believe in the resurrection. They believe that whatever you get, you get while you're alive upon this earth in the flesh, and after that, you're just dead. You go into the ground, they cover you up, and they leave a marker saying what your name was and when you lived. And... The only thing you have is your reputation for however, however long that lasts. But these, again, do not believe in the resurrection. And they know that Christ does. So they asked him, saying, verse 24, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Verse 25. Now, there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased. In other words, he died, having no issue. In other words, he, he had no children. And it, it was clear that what the duty was. He left his wife unto his brother. Okay, his brother's supposed to raise up seed to him. That was the law. Verse 26. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. In other words, all seven brothers died. Verse 27. And last of all, the woman died also. Verse 28. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Verse 29. Jesus answered unto them and said, You do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. In other words, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't know the word of God, nor the power of God. And naturally, a, an atheist aspect wouldn't. Verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In other words, they don't need fleshly, carnal desires. They don't need a wife or a husband there. They have a husband, Christ. Verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Saying, verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, God said, I, God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, These men had long passed by the time God spoke that. Now, most people living in their fleshly wisdom think, well, yes, he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they're all dead now. What Christ is telling them here is, God did not say to you, I am the God of those men that were alive once before and are now long dead, but I am the God of the living. 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all alive in the heavenly estate, as are all our loved ones who have passed on from this life, whether they be bad or good, because judgment is not been yet. Verse 33. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that, he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. In other words, they came unto him. It's time for the Pharisees to get some more licks in here. Well, actually, it's time for them, the chief priests, the most high priests, to have a talk with this uh, one preaching this wisdom and this doctrine which no one can answer. Verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, scripture lawyer here. This is, this is a scripture lawyer. This is not just a, a an everyday lawyer. One of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, verse 36, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Verse 38, This is the first and great or greatest commandment. Verse 39, The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, how can Christ make a statement like that, just blanketly? Well, because it is the Word of God. It is for all men. And it is the will of God that all come to the truth. In other words, the very Bible of Christ's time was the Torah and, and the, the prophets that came after the books of Moses. And what Christ has just told him is the first and second commandment given. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, they all back it up in their words. Verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, verse 42, saying, What think ye of Christ? In other words, they don't know he is Christ yet, okay? And, and even if they did, they would, try, as, as we know from history, they, they killed him. But he's asking him, what do you think about Christ? What do you think about the Anointed One, the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, the son of David. In other words, what, what they're telling Christ here is, he will be born through the son, or, or through the seed line of David. Verse 43. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, verse 44, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now you should know that. That's Psalms 110. David wrote that psalm. So who was David talking about? Verse 45. If David then called him Lord, how is he then his son? You see, these people could not see past the flesh. David called him Lord because he is the Lord. He is God. And not only God, but in the flesh, he is called Yahshua, which means God's Savior. He's also called Emmanuel, which means God dwelling with us. God with us. God that came down unto man in the flesh. Verse 46. And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> in other words, he, 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 put a, he put a wrench right into their uh, plans. Because they didn't have the knowledge to answer him. Why did they not have the knowledge to answer him? Because they couldn't see the spiritual. These scribes and Pharisees walked the way of Cain. Their money, their power, their wealth, their personal glory, their 
fleshly pleasures are more important to them than the things of God. Why? Because they are, in fact, the children of Cain, many of them, the, and the Israelites that were duped by their doctrine. The Jews, I should say, and the Levites and the uh, Benjamites that were there at the time, dwelling in the land, the ten tribes having gone north. But they couldn't answer him. <coughs> now we're going to drop back a few chapters. The whole purpose, of, purpose of, uh, of doing that was to show you how that the Kenites, the sons of Cain, the, the religious community, the scribes and Pharisees and the lawyers, will all approach you with respect and flatteries and say wonderful things to you. Lord, we know that you're a good man. We know that you are a teacher of the word of God and truth and you are not a respecter of persons. And then, of course, they're going to try to catch him in something they can trip him up and use. But they can't because Christ is infinitely a thousand times more smarter than they are. Though he dwelled in the flesh. So we're going to drop back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to see another instance of this. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, the words of Christ. Judge not that you be not judged. Okay, that's, that's a pretty simple statement by Christ. Don't go around in judgment of others. You know, this is all too easy for us to judge other people. We do it all the time. Myself included. And I have to ask repentance. I have to remember this saying of Christ. I have to remember not to let the flesh take hold of me and to judge people because you never know what people have been through. Even those who are doing perversion, even those who are doing bad things, you never know what walk they have walked in life which led them there. It's not an excuse for their sins. But they have to answer to God alone and not to me or you. Therefore, as Christ said, judge not that you be not judged. Verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. In other words, if you think you're so high and mighty that you can sit in judgment of others, guess what? God's going to give you the same treatment. Verse 3. And why beholdest thou the mote, which is to say the splinter, that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Beam here would be a, a, a large stick or even a, a board. Verse 4. Or how wilt thou say unto thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, thou hast a beam in thine own eye. In other words, how can you, if you've got a beam in your eye, which is blocking your vision, grab a little tiny splinter out of your brother's eye? The whole lesson being here, uh, sort of directed at the Kenite, who, who did sit in judgment of people, they did sit in the seat of Moses, which means they interpreted the law and dispensed the word of God. but they were unfair judges. They were able to be bribed. They were respecters of persons. They played favorites. Much like we see going on in the Supreme Court now. now listen to what Christ says to them in verse 5. Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam that is in thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. In other words, make sure that your sight is clear and that you are able to see the truth before you try to correct your brother in a lesser sin. Why a lesser sin? Because he's only got a splinter in his eye when you've got a beam in yours. Verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, Neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample you under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, those of you who do understand the truth should, should really get a message from this one. How many times have you gone out to preach the word to somebody or sat down one-on-one -on -one with a neighbor, a friend, a cousin, a relative and have them totally get angry with you? 
even to the point of fighting. Why is the word dogs used here? Well, because a dog is a dumb animal, okay? It's not really referring to dogs. Uh, the Gentiles are referred to as dogs in some places. A Gentile is one that is unlearned of the truth. Now, I know the other connotation for a Gentile, which means they're not of the tribes of Israel, or they're not a Jew. But the real connotation is they're, they're not learned of the law. They don't know God's word. They're a Gentile. They worship false gods. So Christ says, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast your pearls, that is to say pearls of wisdom, pearls of truth, before swine. Swine is an unclean animal. Lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. In other words, many of you are going to reach out to people and try to help them see the truth, and they're going to rebel against you. They're going to speak ill of you. You know, you know what is one of the funniest things about Just Thought Studies channel? Is every day, no, I'm not going to say every day, but every week, I get about 10 new subscribers. And of those 10, usually about 8 unsubscribe. I don't know what it is that they hear something they don't like, but it's like, oh, did you hear what he said? Oh my God, he's teaching to get the rapture. <coughs> and they unsubscribe. Does that bother me? No, not in the least. I don't let things like the amount of subscribers or the amount of likes I get on a video bother me. I mean, if people like it, they like it. R roughly about 10% of the people that listen to me like the studies as far as putting a like on the study. And that's okay. I'm not asking for likes and I'm not asking for subscribers. Whatever happens, happens according to the glorious will of our Father. And I'm not a perfect man. I can be mistaken. But this is what Christ says in verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. What is he telling us to ask for? For the truth. For the light of the truth. For knowledge. For wisdom. For understanding. That's why I pray the way that I do virtually every time I start one of these Bible studies. Seek, and ye shall find. In other words, search the scriptures. Read your Father's word. Knock, and the door shall be open, or it shall be opened unto you. Christ said, I am the door. Verse 8. Uh, verse eight. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And everyone that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. You know what the problem is today though? Many ask for it. And when they receive it, they receive it gladly. But then they go about with their life and they quit looking. They quit seeking it. They quit knocking at the door. They quit visiting with Christ. And they get pulled away into false doctrines. Because Christ never spake a lie. And in this very verse he just said, For everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be opened. Verse 9. Or who, or, excuse me, or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread will give him a stone? Now please see the deeper connotation than this. Christ is the bread of life. Satan is the false rock. What man of there is a, of, of you whom if his son asked for bread, in other words, if he asked for morsels of truth, the living word is going to give him the false rock. Verse 10. Or if he ask a fish, fish being the tetragamation of Christ in Greek, will give him a, a serpent. In other words, if you ask God for truth, do you think he's going to give you the serpent? 
If you ask God for the bread of life to nourish your soul, do you think He's going to give you the false rock? Absolutely not. This is why Christ said men ought to always pray. If you don't have enough knowledge, ask for more. God will give you your portion. He will keep feeding you. It is men that will give you the serpent. It is men that will give you false doctrines in place of God. It is men that will lead you to worship the first Christ that sets foot on this earth, which is the Antichrist, the spurious Christ, the pseudo-Christos, which means the fake Christ. Verse 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, uh, uppercase F on the word father there, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Now, I want to uh, clarify something here. In this verse 11, he says, If ye then, being evil, okay, now, are these people that are gathered around him necessarily evil? Well, some of them have evil intent, necessarily the scribes and Pharisees, but he's addressing everyone here. So we're going to go and look up this word evil. The word evil is G4190. Poneros, or Poneros. From a derivative of 4192, which means hurtful. An example, evil properly in effect or influence. Thus differing from G2556, which refers rather to the essential character, as well as from G4550, which indicates degeneracy from original virtue. Figuratively, calamitous. Also, passively, ill. Diseased. But especially, morable, culpable. Derelict. Vicious. Facinerous, neuter, mischief, malice, guilt, masculine, the devil, sinners, bad, evil, grievous, harm, lewd, malicious, wicked, or wickedness. See also G4191. So what is Christ really saying here? If ye then, being sinners, or being culpable to evil, or under the influence of the doctrines of men, or a degenerate, or diseased, which means sick in spirit, or it can't even mean foolish if you want to take it to that level. If ye being all of that, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, God, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Basically, this word paneros means a sinner or a doer of sins. Does it mean that the people are necessarily outright evil as Satan is evil? Verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men do to you, even so, do ye even so unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. In other words, if you want to be treated good, treat your neighbor good. If you want to be treated bad, treat your neighbor bad and see how, just how fast that'll happen. You know, all you got to do is read the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes to see what uh, David and Samuel learned about being good to people and being bad to people. Verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate for Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go thereat. In other words, uh, mostly unwilling. In other words, unknowingly, they're headed for destruction. They don't even have any idea that they're doing that. Because they're too concerned with the world or what, what can be done for them. What kind of power they can achieve. Verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. That is to say, eternal life. And few there be that find it. In other words, there's a lot of Christians in the world. There's a lot of religious people in the world that claim to worship the same God, no matter what name they call Him by. 
but only those that truly seek Him and find that narrow way, which is Christ, are going to find eternal life. And many of them are not going to find eternal life. And praise be to our merciful Heavenly Father that He set aside a day of His life, a thousand years to us, the millennium, to teach those poor ignorant fools that were also holy and mighty with their priest robes on and gloried in their power and their influence over men. and lost sight of the truth of why they were even there at the temple, or as many do today at the church. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. In other words, what, we follow what? The lamb slain. And they claim to be his flock, his sheep. In other words, they claim they pretend to be Christians. They are play actors and hypocrites, not unlike the scribes and Pharisees. Inwardly, they are ravening wolves. What's a ravening wolf? That's a wolf that will eat up anything. Anything that pleases his gut. Anything that pleases his belly. In other words, they will believe any doctrine which sounds good to them. Verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Or figs of thistles. Now, if you've studied with this ministry any length of times, you know that the thorns and the thistles, even the bramble, and a few other words that mean the same thing, are symbolic of the Kenites. Or symbolics of those things which can harm your flesh. In other words, grab you a handful of thorns. Grab onto a beautiful rose, you know. A rose of such beauty. Grab onto the stem of it and see what happens. It's going to leave you a bloody mess. And what is Christ looking for here? The fruit of the vine. And he made us fishermen of men. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Answer, no. Do they gather figs of thistles? And we're talking about good figs here, not bad figs. The answer is absolutely not. Verse 17. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. In other words, there's plenty of fruit out there. You know, this is kind of the same analogy as was used back in Genesis with the fruit of the tree of life being the good fruit and the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil being evil fruit, which brought forth a corrupt seed line. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. In other words, a true teacher of God's word will not bring forth false doctrine. And a corrupt tree, a false teacher, cannot bring forth good doctrine. His doctrine is unsound. He's going to lead people off the narrow path. Verse 19, Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, how do you find out whether their fruits are good or not if you don't know? Well, you test the fruit. You test it as to how well it matches up with Scripture through the volume of the book. Not just a cherry-picked scripture here or there which can say almost anything anyone wants it to say. But how it aligns with the whole of God's Word. Verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, in other words, even calls him Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven in other words, those are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You'll notice the word Father there is uppercase again. Capitalized for a reason because it means God Almighty, our Heavenly Father. 
Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day. What day? The day of the Lord. The day of Christ's return. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Verse 23. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Imagine how that would feel to go up to Yahshua, to Christ, and to know that you had, in fact, done good works. In other words, you're probably charitable. That you probably even believed upon Christ enough to cast out devils. And that you had done good works in His name. But that you had taught false doctrines and misled many. That's the only reason why Christ would profess unto them, I never knew you. And depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In other words, your works were that of iniquity. Another good example for you to take from this is the Kenites, the scribes and Pharisees as of that time, always tried to look like upstanding men. They always look holy in their priest robes. And it's very similar to our politicians and our uh, good pastors and priests and so on that we see today standing up at the pulpits. Oh yes, they look holy. They may even get up there and scream, Satan, get away from me! Get away from me, Satan! Depart ye from this room! Depart ye from this flock of your children! Or flock of God's children! I have seen so many pastors over the years put on such good and convincing shows knowing full well that they're teaching people to, to, to fall down and worship the wrong Christ. And they're teaching people to enjoy prosperity. Go out and make yourself millions of dollars and, and, and God gave it to you. If you got that new Lamborghini, it's because God gave it to you. People really should start paying attention to their pastors and their priests and how they live and the pomp and the uh, wealth that they bring in. Did our, uh, did our Lord live that way? Did John the Baptist live that way? Did the prophets live that way? Did the disciples of Christ, the apostles, did they live that way? No. Remember what Christ said, He that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Verse 24, Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, see that there's a qualifier there, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And we're talking about the rock here. It's not capitalized here for whatever reason. But we're talking about the rock of salvation. We're talking about the rock of ages, Christ. Not the false rock. Verse 25. And the rain descended. And the floods came. You know, there's floods promised are going to come in the book of Revelation. And the winds blew. And beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. A solid foundation. Verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon sand. Verse 27. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. In other words, the house was desolated. And great was the fall of it. Now you can liken these houses to churches. And it might give you a better scope of understanding of what's being said here. A church that is founded upon false doctrine or the perversions of men and it's got its little rainbow flags up and waving and teaches doctrines of uh, men in place of the Word of God are not Bethels. 
which is to say houses of God, but they are best events, they're houses of emptiness. Verse 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Of course they were. Verse 29. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. What's the difference between someone who teaches with authority and someone who teaches like the scribes? Well, the scribes were placators. The scribes were respecters of pe persons. Oh, come right up here and take the chief seats in the synagogue. Sit right up here in the front row where everyone can see you. And make sure when that silver plate gets passed in front of you that you cram it full of bills so that everyone looks at you and says, Wow, what a great Christian. Only that wad of money is going to build a church wherein there is no truth, oftentimes. In other words, what is the difference between one having authority? Well, he had the authority. He was the Son of God. But not only that, he had the authority because he spoke only the truth. The scribes and Pharisees, on the other hand, are more simple teachers, and they stand up in front of their churches and speak wonderfully to their congregations. Or they get up and they scream to act like they have authority. Or they talk very nicely and very slowly and they say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But they don't ever get around to teaching the meat of God's word. Most people cannot handle the meat of God's word. That's why Christ said, few there be that go at. A lot of people can't handle that. It's too rich for their stomach. They've been fed on baby's milk. Milk toast Christians. At any rate, that's where I'm going to end this Bible study. I hope this has helped you to understand in seeing the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees, how they play both sides of the field. They come to you as one thing, even though they are another. They come to you as concerned about your finances, concerned about the economy, concerned about everyone's rights and freedoms, but they have no concern for your rights and freedoms. They're all about their world government. At any rate, stay in your Father's Word every day. Use the tools afforded to us to study our Father's Word. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the J.P. Green's Interlinear, the E.W. Bullinger Companion Bible, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, the Septuagint, the Masoretic Texts, whatever you can get your hands on to study our Father's Word, specifically through the King James Bible, the most accurate Bible out there, there are some other good translations. You can also study with them. But first and foremost, when you study, pray to our Father for guidance, wisdom, and understanding. Because it is His promise, as we've just read, that He will give it. To anyone who asks, He will give. And if you keep asking, He will keep giving. And brothers and sisters, Always remember to pray for these that walk in darkness because God knows in this darkened world they are the ones that need it the most. Until we see you next time, may God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.